let me start by introducing our speaker today, Charles Horowitz. Uh, Chuck is a full professor at the Indiana University in Bloomington. He got his PhD from Stanford University around 1981 uh, under Valachka. He had a postdoc position, or actually I'm not sure, probably two postdoc positions at Niels Bohr Institute at, and MIT. Uh, he uh, became an assistant professor at MIT in 84. In 87, he became an associate professor at Indiana University, and he is a full professor at Indiana University in Bloomington now, uh, until now. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society, and he received a, a, an award of outstanding referee from uh, Journals of American Physical Society. He serves on uh, numerous professional organizations. Uh, he serves on the boards of training and advanced low energy theory, talent, a program uh, facility for rare isotope beings, uh, theory alliance. Uh, he also serves uh, at the National Science Engineer Research Council of Canada uh, on the evaluation group. Uh, he's working in many fields, closely related, uh, neutron rich dense matter, neutron stars, uh, gravitational waves, neutrino interaction in supernova explosions, laboratory measurements of nuclear properties uh, that are relevant for astrophysics. And I'm very glad that he agreed to give uh, a colloquium here. Uh, so with that, I'll give the microphone to Chuck. Great, well, thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation. Um, good morning uh, or uh, whatever, good noon, um, depending on your time zone. Um, uh, good Zoom. Uh, happy to, to give this uh, talk. I hope it uh, can be informal. So please, um, if you have questions, um, just uh, go ahead and, and ask. My story begins um, way back uh, in 2005. Uh, we have a first detection of gravitational waves. Uh, so, so just uh, actually, let me ask: Can people see the, my cursor? The yes. Arrow? Yes. Uh, great. It's visible. Um, so the the so-called chirp signal. Um, this is two merging black holes. As the black holes radiate gravitational waves, they move closer together, orbit faster the frequency of the gravitational waves goes up. Uh, and there's a characteristic uh, so-called chirp mass. Uh, how rapidly the signal goes up tells us about the mass of the system. This signal lasted about 2 tenths of a second. Uh, and that corresponded to 30 solar mass black holes um, merging. So this was in 2015. Uh, it, of course, led to the 2017 Nobel Prize, richly deserved to Ray Weiss, Barry Barish, uh, and Kip Thorne. The ink on the Nobel Prize was um, by no means dry, and um, a second uh, extraordinary event happened. Uh, so this is now two years ago, GW170817, so August uh, 17 of, of 2017. Uh, the merger of two neutron stars was observed. Uh, and now if you look at the gravitational wave signal, uh, the, the frequency versus time, time zero is when the stars actually merge, this signal is very much longer. It actually uh, lasted order 100 seconds or more um, compared to the two tenths of a second. Uh, and so the chirp mass associated with this signal is much lighter. Um, uh, around 1.2 solar masses, um, and that's a mass of neutron stars uh, rather than the massive black holes. Uh, when the neutron stars merged, uh, the Fermi and Integral spacecrafts independently detected a short gamma ray burst, uh, and then the so-called kilonova was observed in X-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, uh, and radio wavelengths, so a tremendous uh, amount of uh, electromagnetic data uh, and the gravitational wave information uh, on this single neutron star merging event. Uh, 
And, and so for this uh, colloquium, I just want to talk about one feature related to dense matter, the very end of the signal, exactly how the signal rises just before the neutron stars merge, that contains information on the equation of state and on the deformability of the two neutron stars. So the gravitational uh, field of one of the two neutron stars is actually deforming the shape, inducing a quadrupole moment in the other neutron star. Uh, and just to get uh, kind of oriented, think of the dipole polarizability of an atom. Uh, if you start in the ground state, uh, the dipole operator, this could represent the electric field of the photon, goes to an excited state. Um, you square that matrix element. Uh, it scales with the size of the system, so the numerator goes like the radius of the atom squared. You divide by an energy denominator, you're going to some final state, sum over all the final states. The energy denominator, a Coulomb system, scales like 1 over R, so the dipole polarizability of an atom scales like the radius of an atom cubed. For the gravitational system, uh, the dipole moment just locates the center of mass, uh, so we're instead interested in the quadrupole polarizability, um, which uh, the gravitational wave community call the deformability. Uh, and this deformability of a neutron star scales not as r cubed, but as r to the fifth. Um, so you start in the ground state, the tidal field of the other neutron star um, induces this quadrupole moment. So the quadrupole operator scales with r squared. You square that matrix element, that's r to the fourth. You divide by an energy denominator for, for a gravitational system, again, goes like 1 over r. So this deformability, capital lambda, scales with the size of the system, the radius of a neutron star to the fifth power. Uh, and this figure shows the original observations uh, of the deformability. And I apologize, the figure is a little bit uh, complicated, um, but bear with me just a second. So lambda 1 is the deformability of the more massive star. Lambda 2 is the deformability of the less massive star in the binary. And the observations um, favor smaller values. So, so the darker shading is, is more probable. Uh, so, so the observations basically set limits on, on the deformability. So this is the gravitational wave information um, uh, constraining the size of a neutron star and the equation of state. Um, and I want to compare this uh, astrophysical information uh, with laboratory information uh, on the equation of state. Uh, so I'm going to come back to, to this uh, result for lambda uh, in just a second after I talk about uh, a laboratory experiment. Uh, so the experiment I want to talk about uh, is called PREX. Uh, it uses parity violating electron scattering to accurately measure the neutron radius of lead. Uh, and we'll see this has important implications uh, for, for neutron rich matter, the structure of neutron stars, uh, and astrophysics. Um, uh, if you like, we want to compare two isotopes. Um, lead 208. Uh, has 44 extra neutrons, so it's got 82 protons, 126 neutrons. Those extra neutrons, we'll see in just a second, uh, are expected to form a neutron-rich skin around lead. Uh, and actually, the pressure of neutron matter, neutron-rich matter, is forcing those neutrons out against surface tension. So a large pressure gives you a thick skin uh, thick neutron skin uh, for, the, for the lead 208 nucleus. Uh, likewise, a neutron star, it's the pressure that's holding the star up against gravity, uh, and a high pressure gives you a large radius for the neutron star. So the radius of a neutron star and the neutron radius of lead 
uh, are correlated. A neutron star is 18 orders of magnitude larger than a lead nucleus, so, so my picture isn't quite to scale. Um, but it's the same neutrons, the same strong interactions, uh, and the same equation of state. So a measurement of the neutron radius in lead has important implications uh, for the structure of neutron stars. Okay, so, so what we're doing, we want to measure the pressure. We want to measure the equation of state. Um, uh, measure the pressure is a barometer. Uh, so, so let's talk uh, about a surface tension barometer. Pressure is force per area, so we're going to measure a force. Um, you measure a force with a spring and a ruler. The spring constant in this case is calibrated by the known surface tension of nuclei. From the semi-empirical mass formula, we know what the surface energy uh, of a nucleus is, how the binding energy scales with the surface area. Um, so, so that calibrates our spring. Um, the ruler is this experiment, PREX, which is measuring the neutron radius, uh, and in particular, how much the neutrons stick out compared to the protons. So it's measuring the neutron skin thickness of lead. So, so the ruler and the spring constant gives us a force. You divide the force by the known surface area. So we're measuring the pressure of neutron-rich matter uh, at nuclear density. Okay, in a little more detail, here's a, a simple relativistic mean field model for the lead nucleus. This is density versus radius. Uh, the red dashed line is the proton density, so there's 82 protons. If you fold the point proton density with the known charge form factor of a proton, you get the solid red dot uh, line, that's the electromagnetic charge density uh, of lead. This is the model prediction. Uh, we've measured the charge density, uh, and actually this model is pretty close to the experimental data, but I don't show you the experimental data. So we know where the protons are, we know where the charge density, what the charge density of lead is. Um, the new information is where the neutrons are. So there's 126 neutrons. The black dashed line is the point neutron density. If you fold the, the point neutrons with the weak form factor of a neutron, uh, we get what's called the weak charge density, more on that in just a second. We're going to use parity violation, the weak interactions, to, to locate uh, the neutrons. So this black solid line is the weak charge density in lead. Uh, and that's what the experiment is probing. Uh, and in particular, we're measuring uh, the weak radius, how much the weak charge or the neutrons stick out compared to the electromagnetic charge or the protons. So we're measuring this skin thickness, uh, and that's the experiment. So PREX uses parity violation to cleanly isolate the neutrons. Um, and the important point is down here. It's a purely electroweak reaction, which is free from most strong interaction uncertainties. So, so the neutrons only stick out a little bit compared to the protons, so you have to measure that distance with a very clean probe. Chuck? Yes. I believe there is a question. Cole, sure. would you like to ask yourself? Hi, Chuck. In the, the previous slide where you had your figure of density, uh -huh. what you show with the arrows, which is indicating the skin thickness, is it the same density in both cases? I would have guessed that it would be the thing, it would be to measure the same fraction of the central density in both cases. Um, so, so that's a good question, and, and, and I apologize. Uh, the figure is just a simple representation. What we really measure is the RMS radius of the weak charge and compare it to the RMS radius uh, of the electromagnetic charge. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, and we're using parity violation. Um, in the standard model, um, the proton uh, has uh, this weak charge, which is one minus four 
uh, sine squared of the weak mixing angle, um, and that happens to be very small. Uh, the weak charge of a neutron is big, so the weak interactions at low momentum transfers uh, is a very clean probe of neutrons. Um, and, and what we actually measure is the parity violating asymmetry. So it's the difference, um, the fractional difference, the cross section for scattering positive helicity electrons from the nucleus minus the cross section for scattering negative helicity electrons. And if you reflect the system in a mirror, the positive helicity goes to negative. So, so this observable um, is parity violating. So, so with only electromagnetic interactions, uh, the cross sections are equal. Um, the asymmetry is first order in the weak interactions. So it's order G Fermi, uh, Q squared is the momentum transfer, but you measure the weak form factor. So FW of Q squared, that's the Fourier transform of the weak charge density, um, and, and that's basically the neutron density. So, so this is a way to model independently, map out the distribution of weak charge in a nucleus. Um, so that's what you could do in principle by measuring at several Q squareds. Um, in practice, the experiment only measures at one low Q squared, uh, and basically gave, that gives us the weak radius. Okay, so the experiment ran uh, for the first time. We had a first run uh, in 2010. Uh, it's 1 GeV electrons elastically scattering uh, from a thick lead foil uh, at about 5 degrees. The measured parity violating asymmetry is 0.66 parts per million. So it's a very small asymmetry. It's the weak interactions. Um, and from that asymmetry, I inferred the, the neutron skin inlet. So, so the neutron RMS radius minus the proton RMS radius is about 0.3 Fermi's. Um, the error here uh, is dominated by the statistical error uh, in the original measurement. Um, since that time, we've now had a second run called PREX2, um, where we uh, accumulated much more statistics. The goal for PREX2 was to reduce this uh, error uh, by about a factor of three. Um, so more accurately determining the neutron radius and the goal was to measure that to about 0.06 Fermi's. Um, so the experiment ran last summer. We've taken the data. It's, um, the analysis is, is ongoing. Uh, everything is going great. Uh, and the plan is to announce the results uh, for PREX2 uh, at the fall division of nuclear physics meeting uh, in October. So in addition to lead, uh, we have another measurement uh, on calcium 48. So uh, in the whole periodic table, if you want a neutron rich nucleus that's stable and doubly closed shell, then there are only two possibilities. So the only two closed shell stable neutron rich nuclei are lead 208 uh, and calcium 48. Uh, and so C-Rex uh, is a very similar experiment. Uh, it measures uh, the neutron radius of calcium 48. Calcium 48, of course, has 28 neutrons uh, and 20 protons. Um, PREX ran last summer. CREX ran um, in the fall and, and actually uh, is, uh, so, so Jefferson Lab, of course, closed down for the virus, um, but is now opening up again. Uh, so, so actually CREX is just starting to run again um, to, to uh, collect their final statistics. Great, so what I wanna do is compare the gravitational wave results uh, with the laboratory PREX experimental results. Uh, so, so bear with me a second uh, for this figure. So, so the figure on one axis is the deformability of a 1.4 solar mass neutron star. So the bigger 
lambda is the softer and more squishy, more deformable, the neutron star is. On this axis down here, we've got the radius uh, of a 1.4 solar mass neutron star. Um, and then there's a funny axis on the top, and the spacing is a little bit funny. Um, but this is uh, the neutron skin in lead. So this is the neutron radius minus the proton radius uh, of lead 208, um, and that's in the axis up here. So the original uh, LIGO data from GW170817, uh, the neutron star merger, gave this green dash upper bound. The lambda is below uh, the green line here. Um, and actually, since then, they've reanalyzed the same gravitational wave data uh, with a few more uh, very mild assumptions. Uh, and they now actually are claiming a somewhat better limit. So actually, they have a revised upper bound that lambda, whoops, um, for a 1.4 solar mass neutron star actually has to be below this um, gold dash line. So only the bottom part of the figure is favored by the LIGO gravitational wave data. OK, great. Now, these blue circles are our points, and, and Farouk Fatoyev and Jorge Pikarevich um, uh, were involved in this. Um, these are calculations for a number of different relativistic density functionals. So for each functional, you can predict the equation of state, so you can predict the radius and deformability of the neutron star. Um, but also for the functional, you can predict the structure of lead 208, uh, and you can predict uh, the neutron skin thickness. Uh, so each functional predicts values for all three quantities. Uh, and we've done it for a series of different functionals. So, so they have different uh, equations of state. They have different parameters for, for the equation of state. Um, and this blue curve here is something like r to the fifth. Uh, and so that's showing you, again, that the deformability goes like the radius of a neutron star uh, to about the fifth power. OK, so if you compare this upper bound from LIGO that you have to be below down here, you can see a couple things. First, that there's an upper limit of about 13 kilometers. Other people get slightly different results for that upper limit. Um, so, so this suggests there's an upper limit to the radius of a neutron star. LIGO suggests that neutron stars are smaller than 13 kilometers. They also suggest the neutron skin in lead is smaller than about 0.21 Fermi's. The original PREX number is up here at 0.3 Fermi's, uh, but there was this significant statistical error. So the overlap of the PREX and LIGO results uh, are this, uh, is this region here, um, suggesting that the neutron skin uh, is going to be smaller than the 0.3 Fermi's, um, maybe 0.21 to about 0.15 Fermi's. That's the suggested region uh, if you combine PREX uh, and LIGO. Great. Um, so in a little more detail, we're probing the equation of state. And different observables have a different characteristic density associated with them. So lead, we're probing the equation of state at low densities uh, around nuclear density. The radius or deformability of a neutron star is most sensitive to the equation of state uh, at around two times nuclear density. And the maximum mass of a neutron star depends on the pressure at high densities. So the maximum mass is a high density observable. The radius or deformability is a medium density observable. And then the neutron skin thickness in lead uh, is a low density observable. 
Uh, and if, for example, PREX2 were to find a very thick lead skin, while the radius and deformability appear to be small for a neutron star, that could suggest a strong softening of the equation of state with increasing density, uh, and that might be a strong evidence for a phase transition. Okay, uh, and again, uh, we should have PREX2 results uh, by the fall division of nuclear physics meeting. Great. So the last or third run uh, of LIGO uh, observed a bunch more black holes. Uh, and I just wanted to talk about one event from, from the third observing run uh, of LIGO, which uh, just finished up. Uh, in August, or on August 14th last year, so basically uh, one year ago, um, LIGO observed the merger of a massive black hole with a 2.6 solar mass uh, compact object. Okay, this 2.6 solar mass object, so, so LIGO determines the mass very well. Um, we'll come back to that uh, in just a second. Um, this is either the most massive neutron star ever observed or the least massive black hole ever observed. Is this a neutron star? Is it a black hole? Well, we tried to uh, build an equation of state that could hold up 2.6 solar masses. Um, so our attempt uh, is this equation of state we call Big Apple. It's a relativistic energy functional. It has a 2.6 solar mass maximum mass for the neutron star. So it's very stiff at high densities. Uh, and now the tension, the hard part, was to make it soft around twice nuclear density. So the deformability is only 700 for a 1.4 solar mass neutron star. And that fits, or at least it's close, to uh, the original uh, gravitational wave information uh, from, from the neutron star merger uh, in 2017. So it barely fits the deformability, uh, and it does hold up a 2.6 solar mass neutron star. Um, but it's difficult to do both of those things. Um, and one way to see how difficult it is, is this is the pressure not of neutron rich matter, so it's not the equation of state of a neutron star. This is the pressure of symmetric matter. And, and the uh, pressure of Big Apple is this red line here, up here. And now, heavy ion collisions at about 1 GeV per nucleon energies, um, if you measure the differential flow in these medium energy heavy ion collisions, people have extracted uh, the equation of state, not of neutron matter, but of symmetric nuclear matter. And the region favored by these heavy ion collisions is down here. Uh, so we're up here, uh, something like twice the pressure uh, at the upper limit uh, uh, of this band. So, so Big Apple has a very high pressure for symmetric nuclear matter. Um, uh, and this leads us to conclude that it's really hard to come up with an equation of state that fits the deformability and holds up 2.6 solar mass neutron stars. So the clear conclusion is that this object um, is uh, almost assuredly uh, the lightest observed black hole. Okay, great. So we wanna study dense matter with gravitational waves. Uh, the interesting question, the big question, um, what is the nature of dense matter? What are neutron stars made of? That's a really good question. Are they made of nucleons? Are they made of quarks? Uh, meson condensates. What's the nature of dense matter? Um, that's a much richer, much more interesting equation question than just what is the equation of state. So, so why do we have this bias that we've spent all this time talking about the equation of state when what we're really interested in what is the nature of dense matter? Uh, so, so I'll come back to that bias in just a second. 
gravitational wave information just, uh, uh, so, so Einstein field equations just care about the stress energy tensor, uh, and that's basically the equation of state. Uh, so uh, it doesn't directly, the gravitational waves don't directly encode nucleons or quarks. So in addition to gravitational wave information, you want to look at, say, transport properties uh, like bulk viscosity or thermal conductivities. Um, uh, and so maybe just a quick comment, the thermal conductivity, the neutrino emissivity, neutron stars cooled by neutrino uh, emission from their dense interiors. Uh, and so that is a very interesting probe uh, of dense matter uh, that can tell you information beyond uh, the equation of state. Uh, so neutron star cooling information uh, is a very important addition. Um, how does cold dense matter in a neutron star compare to hot dense matter in the laboratory at Rick or very neutron rich matter in the laboratory uh, at EFRIT? Um, one uh, comment, uh, let me tell you my prejudices. Uh, Rick, uh, the relatives of Kevian Collider at Brookhaven, found that hot dense matter uh, forms a strongly interacting quark gluon plasma. So, so at relativistic heavy ion collisions, uh, you form this strongly interacting plasma. Um, my prejudice is this almost assuredly means uh, that neutron star matter cold dense matter in a neutron star is also likely very strongly interacting, could be strongly interacting nucleons, could be strongly interacting quarks, but it's not uh, an asthmatotic uh, free Fermi gas uh, of quarks. Okay, these are all great questions uh, for, for this colloquium series. Um, there's a lot uh, of really good speakers um, uh, really good experts on, on many of these topics. Um, so, so I didn't want to trample uh, on their talks. Um, so instead of focusing on this, let me back up and just take a really, really broad zoomed out view. Um, where are we? Um, uh, bear with me a second. I really think these are historic times. Uh, it's the stark times with the opening of the gravitational wave sky. The, the really interesting question uh, is what else could be out there in the gravitational wave sky? So, so that's really, really exciting. So, so bear with me just a second. Um, I think the analogy uh, works really well when Galileo first turned his telescope on the heavens. He saw the moons of Jupiter, he saw mountains on the moon, he saw the phases of Venus, he observed sunspots, but that was very dangerous, don't do that. Uh, and not his telescope, but a slightly better telescope uh, could see the rings of Saturn. So, so lots of really exciting, really interesting, really different things. So far in the gravitational wave sky, we've observed mergers of black holes, uh, when LIGO oper is operating now, it detects about one merger, one black hole merger a week. Uh, we've detected uh, at least two neutron star, neutron star mergers, uh, and we've detected a very few uh, black hole neutron star mergers. Um, and the question is, what else could be out there uh, in addition to, to the things we've seen so far? Okay, um, the short answer to what else could be out there is I don't know. Um, it's a whole new uh, universe. Um, we take our prejudices and our biases uh, when we try to fathom uh, a, a new universe. Uh, and so let me just try to tell you a little bit what are my uh, electromagnetic biases uh, as we try to think about gravitational wave astronomy? So in electromagnetic astronomy, you measure the intensity of the radiation, you measure its frequency, uh, and you can measure the polarization 
there are, of course, two polarization states uh, at 90 degrees to each other. Uh, and from this uh, basic observations, you can infer the spectrum so you can measure the temperature and the composition from spectral lines of the emitting region. Uh, and if you've got spectral lines, you can look for Doppler shifts uh, and measure velocities. So this information, temperature, composition, and velocity, uh, comes very quickly from the basic observations. Uh, and of course, the, the fact that you get this information um, is what astrophysics uh, was based on. This created astrophysics. In electromagnetic astronomy, what you don't observe directly is the mass of an object, of course, that makes binary systems so special. You don't directly get information on the density or the shape of an object. Uh, and it's very, very clear, it's very obvious, uh, you don't get the distance to the object directly. Uh, and that, of course, has been a great struggle uh, in astronomy for uh, eons to determine distances uh, to astronomical objects. Okay, so this is electromagnetic astronomy. This is what we know. This is how we think. This is our biases. Uh, whoops. Gravitational wave astronomy is different. You don't measure an intensity. You actually measure an amplitude. The intensity is the amplitude squared. So you measure an amplitude. You measure a frequency. Uh, and you can measure a polarization. There are two polarizations, plus and cross. Now these are at 45 degrees to each other. So, so this is the observations. And from these, you don't infer these things, but you can infer a mass. You can set a direct limit on the density. More on that in just a second. You're very sensitive to the shape, uh, and in particular, the quadrupole moment uh, of an astronomical object. Um, and this is unique to gravitational waves. Um, it's very difficult, for example, to determine the quadrupole moment of the sun from electromagnetic observations. That's a very subtle uh, observation. And you get a distance. And just to show your electromagnetic bias, the distance you get is called a luminosity distance. You almost never measure the luminosity in gravitational waves. Uh, in reality, this should be called an amplitude distance. Basically, the strength of the signal at the source depends on the mass. Uh, and up here for the chirp mass, you've learned the mass. So you know the amplitude at the source. If you measure the amplitude in the detector, the amplitude falls off like one over the distance. So that directly gives you the distance. Um, uh, and so this uh, amplitude distance uh, is, of course, very exciting for cosmology. OK. Uh, and in gravitational waves, you don't observe the composition. Uh, for example, uh, you can't tell whether it's nuclear matter or quark matter. There's no gravitational quark spectral lines to look for. Um, and you don't observe the temperature uh, of the emitting region. OK, so um, what I wanted to do uh, in the remainder uh, of my talk is just give you uh, two uh, examples. So, so we're playing this game. What else could be out in the gravitational wave sky? Uh, and I want to give two examples. Uh, the first example deals with the shape. Uh, and the second example deals with the mass. Um, uh, and actually, before I do that, I want to explain the density because um, that's a remarkable feature uh, of gravitational wave astronomy. Uh, if you have two objects which are gravitationally southbound orbiting at a frequency f, uh, for the two objects not to have already touched, their density must be larger than g rho to the 1 half uh, is of order f. LIGO 
uh, is only sensitive to frequencies above 10 hertz. So actually, uh, if you have two objects and they're gravitationally bound, their density must be larger than 10 to the 10 grams per cubic centimeter uh, in order that they're not already touching, not already merged when they're orbiting at 10 hertz. So you built this instrument, it's only sensitive to objects with densities above 10 to the 10 grams per cubic centimeter. It's a remarkable result. In the whole universe, the only known sources are neutron stars and black holes. So, so you've built this uh, instrument. It looks at the whole universe, uh, and it's only sensitive to the neutron stars and black holes in the universe. Um, and so that's just totally amazing as, as a nuclear physicist that, that we've got this uh, incredible filter. We, we've filtered out at a single stroke all the low density, uninteresting stuff. Uh, in the universe. The other part of this, which just really cries out, um, is the word known. Okay? There's a minimum mass to neutron stars. Uh, we don't uh, know how to make a neutron star below about one solar mass, uh, but never mind that, a neutron star below about 0.1 solar masses is not gravitationally bound. So neutron stars below 0.1 solar masses don't exist. They're unstable. So we know of no LIGO sources with masses below 0.1 solar masses. OK? So I think there's an incredible discovery potential at, at low chirp mass. You have no background. A single well-measured, i.e. a single event with a good signal to noise ratio, um, the chirp mass is one of the best things you determine in, in a gravitational wave event. So a single well-measured event with a low chirp mass would be revolutionary. That event all by itself um, would revolutionize physics. Okay, so keep that. Uh, in mind just for a second. So, so we're going to do two things in my remaining uh, 10 minutes or so. Talk about shape uh, and then talk about chirp mass, this low chirp mass. So uh, the shape. Um, so, so actually this is a great quote from Galileo. I've been led to the opinion, I feel sure that the surface of the moon is not perfectly smooth. But on the contrary, it is just like the surface of the Earth itself, which is varied everywhere by high mountains and deep valleys. So, so Galileo observed the mountains uh, on the moon. Um, I'm using LIGO to search for mountains on neutron stars. I don't know what the surface of a neutron star looks like, um, but following Galileo, I suspect it's not perfectly smooth. There is a question here. Sure. Would you like to ask yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, I have a very uh, layman question, actually. Um, you discussed different uh, parameters that we can figure out. Um, so I was wondering if we could uh, understand uh, anything about the magnetic field of the progenitor uh, neutron stars or what I becomes of it. I no. Uh, the, so, so the gravitational waves typically don't care about them. Actually, I should say only direct, only indirectly. So, so there's a few cases where the gravitational way, uh, excuse me, where the magnetic field can push on the matter enough that the gravitational waves can see the indirect effect of the magnetic field, um, but. The curvature of space doesn't directly care about the magnetic field. Thank you. Okay, so let's consider a, a large mountain. So I, so I drew it in red and I exaggerated it. Um, and large could mean a full centimeter high. Uh, so that's a really big mountain. 
on, on a rapidly rotating neutron star, uh, and, and basically gravity causes space-time to oscillate as the star rotates, and that radiates gravitational waves. It turns out that a mountain on a rotating star, uh, because neutron stars are so dense, it involves a very large mass undergoing large accelerations. Large accelerations, just the fact that it goes around in a circle, and that efficiently radiates continuous gravitational waves. So instead of a burst of gravitational waves, when the two stars collide, we get a weaker signal, but this weaker signal is always on. That, that uh, the neutron star can just sit there and rotate for a really long time. Okay, a fundamental question is how do you hold up the mountain? To produce a strong gravitational wave source at LIGO frequencies, you need very large masses, very high densities, uh, and that places extraordinary demands on dense matter. If you want to generate a gravitational waves, uh, it's easy. You just put a mass on a stick uh, and you shake vigorously. Um, two things, of course, are hard. Uh, you need a very large mass, um, but to shake vigorously. To shake vigorously, you may need a very strong stick. And that stick holds up the mountain and allows it to accelerate or causes it to accelerate. Um, uh, so, so actually, uh, let me talk just a little bit uh, about the very strong stick. So what's the crust strength on a neutron star? So a neutron star is thought to be uh, a liquid with about a kilometer solid crust uh, on the outside. Uh, the radius is about 10 kilometers total. Um, so this is work I did with uh, a material scientist, Kai Cadal, who was then at Los Alamos. Um, we simulated the breaking stress of neutron star crust uh, including impurities, dislocations, grain boundaries, all these imperfections that real materials have. Um, Large-scale molecular dynamics, um, basically we just broke neutron star crust samples on the computer, uh, and we found that the crust is the strongest material known. Uh, it's some 10 billion times stronger than steel. Um, uh, and that's great for us. Uh, because the strong crust can support large mountains. Um, uh, and I should just actually say, a mountain is about centimeter high, but we're interested in large scale mountains, uh, so kilometers wide. And the point of the, realm, of the realm is the ellipticity. So uh, a neutron star has three principal moments of inertia, I1, I2, and I3. If you rotate about the third axis, if I1 and I2 are different, as the star rotates, that will give you a time-dependent mass quadrupole moment, and that will radiate gravitational waves. So if I1 and I2 are the same, the star won't rotate, radiate, um, and the strength of the gravitational radiation depends on their difference. Uh, and the crust is so strong, it can support ellipticities uh, up to a few times 10 to the minus 6, um, and that's actually a big number. Okay, great. How big are mountains on a neutron star? I don't know. Um, this is irrelevant, but it's a pretty picture. This is actually Mars, um, and this is data from, from the laser altimeter the Mars Global Surveyor, and this is just the elevations. So red is high and blue is low. Mars is lumpy, and it's lumpy on the biggest scales. If a neutron star were lumpy like Mars, it would have a big ellipticity, and it would radiate lots of gravitational waves. Um, these are observations. So, so the blue stars are actually observations. We haven't detected any continuous wave signals. Each star is an upper limit on the gravitational wave strain uh, of gravitational waves coming from that particular star. Um, 
H naught are these incredibly tiny numbers. So this is the change in length over the length. LIGO, this interferometer, has four kilometer arms. Uh, and you're sensitive to a change in length of this four kilometer arm by one part in 10 to the minus 26. Um, and that shows you because if you integrate very carefully for a year, you can get incredibly high sensitivities. So you set an upper limit on the gravitational wave strain. It depends on Newton's constant. The moment of inertia of a neutron star is largely known. The gravitational wave frequency is twice the rotational frequency. The distance to the star, the important unknown is the ellipticity um, epsilon. So if you set an upper limit on the gravitational wave strain, you are setting a direct limit on the ellipticity or shape uh, of a neutron star. So, so LIGO is directly measuring this, uh, the shape uh, of many, many neutron stars, uh, and it's finding them to be very round. Uh, and we can, so here are the upper limits on ellipticity versus the frequency of the gravitational waves. This is 100 hertz, uh, 1,000 hertz, and so on. At low frequencies, the upper limits are these blue circles. Uh, we know the ellipticity of, for example, this star here is less than about 2, 10 to the minus 5. Uh, the crust can actually only support an ellipticity of a few 10 to the minus 6. Uh, so the neutron star crust couldn't make an ellipticity this big. Um, so we might not expect a signal, uh, and we don't see it. Um, so, so these uh, upper limits are, are consistent, but perhaps not very interesting. Uh, at high frequency, however, these upper limits can be 100 times smaller than the maximum strength of the crust. Um, and, and so let me just uh, summarize the uh, LIGO's directly probing the shape uh, of neutron stars. Uh, so far, it hasn't detected a, any mountains, um, but I'm optimistic for the future. And one way to think about it is if you try and machine uh, on Earth a very, very round object, um, you can produce an object with an ellipticity of order 10 to the minus 6. LIGO has directly observed ellipticities in the best case less than 10 to the minus 8. So, so neutron stars are directly observed by LIGO to be more than 100 times rounder than what we can machine on Earth. OK, so we're probing um, neutron star shapes. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, it'll be very exciting when we uh, detect uh, a non-zero shape. Um, much of the universe is, is unknown dark matter. Uh, dark matter could form lower mass dense objects, lower mass than uh, a tenth of a solar mass uh, for neutron stars. Uh, and so we're using LIGO to search for low mass clumps uh, uh, of dark matter. OK. And for that, um, just giving you one and a half examples here. Um, these are really historic times with the opening up of gravitational wave uh, astronomy. Uh, and the really exciting question, what else could be out there? Um, LIGO is finding lots of exciting things with the merging neutron stars and merging black holes that they've already observed. Um, but what else could be out there? I don't know. Um, but I'm confident that it will be more wondrous um, than what I can imagine. Um, so I really thank you um, uh, for your attention. Happy to take questions. Let me emphasize all my great uh, collaborators. 
uh, including a number of very good uh, graduate students. Um, so thank you very much. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Chuck, for an interesting presentation. Uh, let's see if we have questions uh, from the audience. Um, anybody in the audience, please? Uh, yes, uh, Jackie, please go ahead. Thanks, Igor. Uh, so Chuck, interesting talk. Uh, I, I definitely agree with you as someone coming from the heavy ion perspective that this crosstalk between neutron stars is really important. I guess my question is the following. Um, the Danielovich paper that you cite there is about 20 years old, and we've learned a lot in heavy ions since then. In fact, there was this really nice Hadi's paper, which is exactly at these beam energies, which found that in fact their probing temperatures of like 70 MeV could be much higher even than that. That was just in nature of physics. So um, with that in mind, it looks like they can only really overlap with neutron star mergers in terms of the equation of state. So my question is the following is how would that affect constraints um, on the equation of state and the interpretation of this, this new compact object? Yes, you're completely correct. Um, there are at least two things going on. So you have to extrapolate in temperature. Um, and what Danielovich et al. did, um, which is a potential sin, but let me not criticize them, um, is basically fit a simple model for the temperature dependence and then extrapolated the finite temperature heavy ion results to a zero temperature equation of state. So that may be right or that may not be right. Um, and so the, the picture I showed uh, was an extrapolation to zero temperature by them. Okay. So, so that's this uh, region here. Jackie, you happy with that answer? Um, yeah, I would say it's, it's much more complicated than that. Um, look, I won't go into a long story, but I would just say that the heavy ion results have changed and our understanding has changed quite significantly since then. So I, I wouldn't, I would, I would guess I would just caution you against taking that too seriously. Um, because most of our understanding has changed quite a bit. Great. My real motivation for showing this example is just to emphasize the, the heavy ion and that you can really produce matter at these densities in the lab. It's more symmetric than a neutron star uh, and it, clearly you want to uh, explore, use the, the laboratory data. Okay, I don't see any other questions from the audience. So I had a question on my own regarding the uh, experiment with the calcium 48. Uh -huh. uh, as you correctly say, said, it's a double closed shell nucleus. And of course, that is a very, very unique uh, nucleus. In fact, I hardly think it's a representative of nuclear matter because of that. Is it fair to use some, any really experimental data from such a very special nucleus to nuclear matter? Um, uh, that's a great question. And, and um, uh, the short answer is probably not. The real use of calcium 48 is to compare to microscopic finite nucleus calculations. I see. So coupled cluster, for example, microscopic calculations with, with chiral effective forces um, uh, have been published for, for calcium-48, and they can't yet, uh, although maybe very soon, do lead. So, so calcium-48 is, is a smaller system to better compare to finite nucleus calculation. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a question from Henry De Jong, please. Go ahead. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. I have a question on... Uh, if we could detect potentially gravitational waves from a, a, a large one, a wide one centimeter bump on a neutron star, what about uh, in a magnetar when you have these strong magnetic emissions or bursts from these crustal deformities uh, on this rapidly spinning uh, neutron star that are probably or presumably at least a centimeter or higher? Could it, would it be possible to detect gravitational waves from a magnetar burst? 
Yeah, so, so it turns out there are a lot of searches for, for gravitational waves from magnet hard burrs. And um, uh, there, there's two uh, issues. One is if it's just a very, very short burst, you need a much stronger gravitational wave signal um, if you're not integrating for a year. Um, so, so in the, the magnetar giant flares are very energetic uh, events, um, but they're probably mostly an electromagnetic. Um, it's really hard to get a lot of energy out in gravitational waves from, from a magnetar giant flare. Um, but lots of people are working on that, uh, and there are lots of searches. Certainly, um, uh, it's nice to have an exact time to search for, for gravitational waves. So, so the LIGO people love to search um, whenever there's uh, an exciting event on the sky, like, like a magnetar giant flare. Um, the very strong magnetic fields in a magnetar um, you can have a big magnetic pressure, uh, and that can actually create, hold up a mountain. Uh, so I talked about crust mountains. You can also have magnetic mountains. And the strong magnetic field in a magnetar, especially if the non-dipole field inside was even stronger than the very strong dipole field outside, that could create a big mountain. Uh, and you and as the star rotates, that mountain would radiate gravitational waves. Alas, the, the catch, um, giant magnetic fields give you huge electromagnetic breaking. So a, a magnetar is incredibly bright, a rapidly rotating magnetar is incredibly bright in an electromagnetic radiation, and that rapidly slows the star down. So, so most of the magnetars we see now uh, are spinning very slowly. So, so they might have big enough mountains, but unfortunately the magnetic field acted like a brake and stopped them from spinning. Very good, thank you very much. Okay, I don't see any other questions from the audience. So, Let's give it maybe 10 seconds if anybody was deciding to uh, have a question. In the meantime, I would like to thank you for a very interesting presentation and uh, in a very good level that explains the physics very clearly. I did get an understanding of certain things definitely much better than before I knew them. So it's very nice. Great, well, thanks very much. And I really appreciate uh, everybody's attention. Thank you.